I, I can't get over you. So the old standards were songs like that, but but in this day and age, it's difficult to remember those things because well, nobody. We don't need to go back to this day and age. We can actually go well, way back to the days that were much better. Damn right. That's what we could do. Damn right. But I mean, corded phones. Imagine standing in one spot when a corded phone. Was <laughs> <laughs> well, then, then they had to extend you, the extension course. You could wrap around the corner. Oh, like you were, you're, you're, almost, you're almost private, that was right? Technology. <clears throat> First right. cell phone. I need to light this in there. The go ahead, light phone. it. Light it if you like. Oh, there you go. Am I keeping it back? No, no, no. We started already. And you don't have to worry about. Do I have to carry Pop, a punch? Uh, you don't have to worry about carrying a punch around. You know, oh, some people Christ. care. No, no. That's carry the, the the right tools for. My, my father smoked cigars until the day he died. I I have ten a day for forty five years. Ten a day for forty-five years. It's just what I enjoy. So, ten a day. This is number five, and it's one o'clock. So, so you grew up around cigars. Mm -hmm. What was your philosophy? Did you did you dislike them as a child? Did you did you no, enjoy them? You no, the house was filled with it. So you so you enjoyed it. I just enjoy it. I can't stand cigarettes. I loathe cigarettes. I think they're hideous things. But I you know I tolerate them. I mean people smoke aboard, but but I just love cigars. I I, I just like them. So is this thing on? It's on. Oh Christ! Hang on one sec. So. We're getting ahead of ourselves, John. Then there. Yeah, sure. Of course. No, we actually are not in the studio today. Um, John, our guest today, made made quite the suggestion, and I jumped all over it. I was very happy to hear it when you said that. Oh, sorry. Why don't you come to the boat and we just set up the cameras? And he thought it was going to be an iPhone. Mm. <laughs> it is much more of a production. It's very professional. We try to be. But I, I think people are going to quickly learn. Um, we're not going to do the standard kind of TCL show here. We're doing a, a show that's the construction life. We're doing a show that's people first. And mm -hmm. Jonathan has his own show, and, and we've got along really well. And then I knew about you, John, probably going on a year or two now, I think. I Possibly. I've been a quiet you. admirer for, as, I think, as long as you've been on. Yeah. But, um, but you've been it. quiet. You've been quiet about it. Well, I just admire and applaud and like. Thanks. I guess that's how we applaud on Instagram. We hit like. Right. Oh, we have my neighbor coming out with his yacht, but he is very, uh, he's very gentle going by, so there won't be any wake. Well, there might be a little bit, but that's fine. We, Mr. we, Mr. Lozon, too. he has a car dealership in Montreal, and that's his yacht. So maybe you'll see him going by. So this is. Um, I don't even want to call this show anything. We're just going to discuss your history, where you came from, what you're doing right now, currently. You're still on the job site. You're still talking to tradespeople. You're still working with clients. You're, you're still uh, engaging. In, and what I love about it is that you're engaging with work that should be the norm. It's not the, the norm. <clears throat> well, there's a philosophy Quality, behind. I mean. Well, as much as you can. I mean, obviously, it, you know, not, not to... To um, <laughs> <laughs> not to sound morbid, but really, you get to a point in life where you realize it's your duty to uh, preserve what we have for the next generation to enjoy, and that's what I try and do. That was my father's philosophy. He comes from a shipbuilding family for 900 years. Uh, I was born and raised in boat building. And his philosophy was always that you have to teach the next generation. If you, we enjoy you know, the, the Roman Colosseum and we enjoy all the beautiful architecture in the world simply because somebody else long gone preserved it. Mm. And it's our duty to preserve it. And in the trades in this day and age, there's not an app for everything. You need hands-on. Yes, very much. You need to know how to carve something, how to cut something, because everything's CNC, and I deplore the CNC machines in this day and age, because nobody's actually really cutting anything anymore and making stuff. And that's So it's all part of the philosophy of preservation. Is it connected to economics? Of course it is. <clears throat> so the, the generation of today that's looking at certain projects... When they look at them, if they were to go the old school route and go the hand carve, go the hands on, they would not be able to survive economically. Is that the idea? I don't think think so. Except it really, I guess it really depends on what you're doing. If you're mass producing kitchen cabinets, if you're 
if your goal is to you know make 10 kitchens a month or 50 kitchens a it's month you though. need cnc machines yeah, to do automation different. but if you just want to create custom which is what i do i like i like to how take many, a home and create something how many kitchens do you see if they are mass produced do you appreciate no you don't no that's what i mean is you yeah. don't appreciate when i see some of your posts and when you when you actually and i love it by the way when you give the commentary to the posts i wish you do every post that way because i love the commentary that's associated with it i could already see it when i'm seeing the posts and i'm understanding where you're going with it but then you you that's very kind you, you drop little hints of history which i absolutely appreciate because there is a purpose behind why we do certain things of course there is. Yeah. There has to be. But I, I agree with you that today it's been lost. It's been lost because of the almighty dollar. Purpose driven is everything. Um, you can, I know a lot of dead millionaires and they had no purpose. They mm. made money. But you didn't you, leave anything. You didn't leave a purpose. No, you have to have a purpose in life and, and share your knowledge. And as I always say, preserve what you have for the next generation to enjoy. And that's not my quote. It is my father's quote. How do you stay humble to that, John? Like, you know, you've lived you, for 40 plus years. You've, you know, more, but, you know, you've lived. Well, I grew and, up in the business. So. You, I know you grew up in this. And not sometimes. Not in a business so much as a, a craft. No. Sure. And sometimes it becomes really easy to become incubated and distracted by other things that you remain humble and committed to preserving the craft. Well, because that's what I enjoy. Any artist does that. I mean, you, you can either choose to make a lot of money and, and for money's sake, or um, or you can just enjoy what you do. And you've got to enjoy what you do. And that's authenticity. You have to. Is there a balance, though? Of course there is, but it's not balance. People screw up work-life balance. Ooh. No, there's no balance. It's called harmony. Harmony. So it's, so it's, it's finding the harmony. Yes. You. I work like a horse. I I work very hard because I enjoy it until the body starts failing a bit and you take some time off. But that is the harmony right there. You, if you enjoy what you do, I've never worked a day in my life, put it that way. I've never worked a day in my life because I enjoy what I do or I wouldn't do it. Simple as that. Do you get a lot of the younger people that get into this industry or any kind of craft? I, I, I like grouping it all together, whether it's wood carving, woodworking, construction, just anything to do with creativity with your hands and your mind. Do you get a lot of the younger generation reaching out to you to discuss how to achieve that? Because yes. I don't think that they know how to achieve it yes, without I it do. being a digital connection to achieve it. And that's, I agree with you. I love that at the beginning of the show, you just started talking about there isn't an app for everything in construction. No, no there isn't. No. No. And when you get working on historic homes, which is the bulk of my work, because I've chosen to do that, then you realize it's. <laughs> It's very humbling because you see things that were done 200 years ago, which is old for this country, um, that you can't do today. You know, stone foundations and things yeah. like that, mm. like everything they did. You have to preserve that. You're looking at timbers that were hand cut and hand split, and we're bitching because the table saw, you know, doesn't work or something, right? You, you just have to learn what they did and learn from it. And it is humbling because you get to see things that they did that we really couldn't do today because it would take such great physical strength. So what do you share with somebody who wants to get into the industry then, today? What do I share? What do you want, what do you want them to know? Well, first of all, study history. Ooh. The historical you architecture. Back. You have to look back. You have to look back. You have to. We built monoliths and things, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago that... And, and beyond. We won't get into Egypt and everything else because that's another subject. But they built things that we really couldn't duplicate today, and it was all by hand. I remember uh, talking to an a archaeologist, uh, archaeological academic once, and he, was, he worked out of the Acropolis, and they were trying to reproduce sections, and they realized that every stacked stone on the columns was not the same because they used whatever stones they had. He was thinking, we're just going to cast one stone and stack them up and it'll be great. No, no, no. Everyone is a different size, everyone is a different height, and it's all stacked up, hand done, every bit of it. And yet when you stand back, it looks uniform. And the other thing he had to correct was the stupidity of putting modern uh, technology into this. So where these stone beams were connected together, they were crumbling. And so they put steel I-beams in 
Well, the steel expands and contracts in the cold, and it was actually cracking and fracturing the stone. God. So you can't apply modern technology so <laughs> to I go, everything. I go back to the dollar. I go back to... Yes. Okay, we can look back in, in history, and we can see that certain structures were built a certain way. But even if you were to go back to the turn of the century and you where the skyscraper started, mm. workers were paid a certain fee, and it wasn't low, it wasn't high. It was a fair fee for their skill level, mm. and they it created, was a living wage. It was a living wage, and they they cre- they created these structures. They were part of these structures. Mm. What I miss in today's construction, there is no pride in what people are building today. No, no. crank it up, just crank it up, crank it out, and get it out, and move on to the next one. Yeah. That's the thing. It's all dollar driven. Okay, well, is that driven from from the the corporations at the top, from the businesses? 100%. I think right? so. But go back one step further. It's driven by the need to produce because our cost of living is outrageous. Okay. Yes, it's outrageous. People are forced to produce. You know, when we were kids, there was no iPhone bills to pay for. There was no, there was thousands and thousands of dollars we spent on this that we spent streaming all this money. services, taxis, all Uber, we, we just food, you, somebody could work a job minimum wage, save money to buy a car, buy a house, and survive. Not today. You can achieve. It's funny on the drive up here. We were actually discussing that. We were trying to figure out how this generation is actually going to own home, home mm-hmm. ownership. How are I, they? It's gonna, not going to happen unless they reduce taxation completely and nobody nobody making minimum wage or 18 or 20 or 25 dollars an hour should be paying any income tax period because you're taxed to death on everything uh somebody from the fraser institute sent me uh, a link about how you take a hundred dollars of your money and the government takes 33 dollars yes, in tax seen you've that. seen that yes. yes and then you buy fuel yes and that's another 40 dollars yes. in tax with the remaining 70 dollars you then have 30 odd dollars left of your hundred dollars that's been taxed it's outrageous do we have an appreciable increase in lifestyle no, no. we have debt we have people that can't afford to live in their homes I see it in the trades. I know people in 2019 that were paying a thousand and eleven hundred dollars a month rent are all of a sudden paying two thousand now. Yes, we saw the skyrocket, and they Here can't afford Canada, to live. And they can't afford to live. And then you get and you then get, they get out. You get the landlord tenant disputes that are going on. You get tenants mm. doing what they're doing. You get landlords doing what they're doing. So, but that's a causation. That's just that's a reaction. Government caused it. Yes, in my opinion, that's the reason why. Period. Period. That is just. To me, that's the causation. They have caused. Do we have a fan? We have a fan. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, (laughs) Jean. No, I love that you made the suggestion. And obviously, if anybody's not watching yet, we're on a boat. On your boat. And there's a dear friend, a dear neighbor over there, uh, Jean Francois. Jean is actually a a retired uh, politician. He was a councillor in Gatineau, and uh, he ran for mayor, and, and didn't win. But he's retired from that now. But he's uh, a good, good chap. He he understands everything we are talking about, and he tried to make a difference, and it didn't didn't work. So, John, is being a tradesperson today is it a smart move? Of course it is, because if you're good in anything in life, you will succeed. But don't expect instant easy money you have to adapt improvise and adapt you have to, to work for it you have to figure out how to and, and know your market and know put it this way if you want to make horseshoes today you're going to fail unless you make horseshoes for the king's plate or yes. for specialized oh, so yes. you've got to specialize if you choose to make horseshoes you know in downtown toronto you're not going to do well <laughs> <laughs> but so there's that aspect of it. There has unless to be some common sense. Those shoes are made to be thrown at certain people. That's right. Yes, but you you might actually have a a great craft, and you might be good at it. The other thing is you could adapt and say, you know, I know how to forge iron ore into this. Maybe I'll also branch out and do hand railings, and yeah, things like that. That's a good point. Like, we, I grew up as a boat builder, so a, a boat has. Stairs, flooring, kitchen cabinets, doors, windows, everything that you'd have in a, in a home. So it was easy for my father and myself to transition to terrestrial. And now, I, I mean, I make circular stairs. I make anything curves. I love doing church doors and windows and things because it's the same principles. There's curves. I love to, love to throw curves and things. But you, my point is you can be good at something, but you might fail economically because there's no demand for it. So you have to adapt and bring your craft or your philosophy to it. Does that make sense? It does. It makes sense.
Meet Jonathan Sinelli, the visionary behind People First Leadership. Jonathan is not your average leadership coach. His People First Leadership approach focuses on putting people at the core of your strategy, creating workplaces where teams thrive and achieve outstanding results. What sets him apart? Jonathan is a master at asking thought-provoking questions that spark genuine conversations and challenge conventional thinking. His deep empathy helps him understand unique challenges and guide people toward impactful solutions. As an accomplished author, media host of the People First podcast, and seasoned project management expert with a background as an electrician, Jonathan offers unparalleled experience and practical insights. Whether you're interested in a one-on-one coaching or breakout room sessions, Jonathan customizes his approach to your needs. He also travels the world, speaking at conferences and business events, inspiring leaders with his dynamic presentations. Discover how people-first leadership can transform your approach and ignite your team's potential with Jonathan Sinelli. Call Jonathan at 416-717-4139 or email him at jc at jonathansinelli.com or reach out to him on his website at jonathansinelli.com. This message is proudly supported by the Construction Life Podcast. Yeah, I, I actually love what you said because I think the flip the flip side of the spectrum occurs where it's like, I'm in construction and I'm going to do everything, mm. right? I'm going to be that, that, that GC or I, I'll, I'll make kitchens for everybody. And what you're saying is, hang on a second. Yeah. Like, know what your market is. I can't know compete who you, with Ikea. Know, know who you're competing <laughs> against, right? Well, it's funny you bring up the kitchen argument because I was at an event recently and um, an established kitchen maker, mm. old school, father business. Mm. Um, they had the fortunate luck of having a TV show with the dad and it was all centered around the dad. Unfortunately, the dad passed through the, the production process of doing the show. Obviously, the broadcaster was asking them to continue doing the show. Mm. The sons all felt no, this business was built off my dad. My mm. dad's not longer here. We don't want to do the show anymore. They kept it. They were always kitchen makers. Mm. My, my, they're all old school. And um, I saw them recently and they just said, we've never seen this industry so bad. We can't compete Agreed. Agreed. with how Agreed. poorly efficient the industry has become. And, and like you said, and I actually said the same thing, it echoes it. I said, you need to adapt. You guys have a certain set of skills. Yeah. And it's whether you want to compete with what's already being built, i.e. Ikea or whatever, or do you want to continue down the same road and find the clients that will appreciate the quality of work that you want to produce? Precisely. It's challenge. It's more challenging that way. It it's a comes lot down to having an interview with your prospective client first. And when they show me a magazine photo and say, I want this and this and this and this and this, and I, if I see everything's mass produced, it's Home Depot trims, it's kitchens it's furnishings from a catalog from wayfair or whatever i say you don't need me if you want something made prime example i had a client about probably 15 years ago and he went to costco and they had the most beautifully elaborately carved serpentine vanity and it was six feet long serpentine doors are the two s shaped doors that come together beautiful obviously made overseas it was eleven hundred dollars he said i want that but this one is pre freestanding I want mine built in and I want it seven feet long. And I said, it's $20,000. He, he called me a crook and he said, it's 1100 at Costco. I said, yeah, but it doesn't fit. I said, they're mass producing that. They've got jigs. I need to make it. So I gave him the names of a few other places to call that actually make serpentine doors and wood carving and created. He got the same prices. I got the job because he said, so he questioned you first. Yeah, he did. He said, how do you go from 1100 to 20000 I said, because I'm making one. It's why Rolls-Royce is a million dollars and a BMW or a Mercedes is, you know, almost a tenth of the price. Not quite, but you know. Right? So can I ask a question one around that? One at a time versus... You triggered something there. Like, what did you do in, in that scenario and many others, but what did you do to actually connect with that potential client? Right. All referral. No, no, I, I, I get how, how you came into orbit with them, but you had a human to human connection there, right? Where you were, you were, you set the boundaries and expectations. Here's what it is. You want this and here's why. Just matter of fact. <laughs> it was just matter of fact. This is what it's going to take because I'm making one. Did I make any extra money on that? Not really. I worked like hell for that $20,000. Sure. How did you come to that figure? Just, I know what it took at the time to make. Based on the I, skills that are required to Well, again, it. as a boat builder, I know what it takes to laminate and curve wood. So I, it's child's play for me. 
So I was able to deduce that. And, but there's very few firms that will do that these days or individuals. What percentage of the market do you think is actually interested in that quality? Not much in Toronto anymore. In Canada, there's very little. It's been it. pushed all out? Pushed all out. Everything is mass-produced crap still. Uh, it's appalling, the architecture these days. It, I see these basketball players and things with their homes, and there's nothing <coughs> really created. I don't mean to denigrate anybody, any other craftsman, not at all. It's just that it's... Are we talking about a, a dumbing down of design, I guess we'd say. It's almost... Um, Fiberglass front doors? Are you kidding me? Mm. Like a stately home needs a wood door. I had a client uh, 25 years ago. I built him a, a log home. It was a beautiful log home. Uh, it was milled logs. It wasn't like hand-hewn. But it was a stately thing, and we did a lot of hand work. Uh, every hand ra railing and balustrade was, was spoke-shaved. That kind of really rustic, traditional hand work. And he goes and puts a bloody Stanley steel door on it. I said, you've wrecked this house. You've wrecked the entrance to the house. And he didn't have that on a month before he said, uh, you're right, I need a wooden front door. It's that dumbing down. People say, oh, I need a door, so I better go to Home Depot and buy a door because they just don't think that you can actually get something made. A lot of people don't think. And Home Depot has ruined that, that stuff. Uh, again, I sound denigrating to people. Obviously, if you can only afford that, and, and I'm not a rich man. I mean, <laughs> far from it. But I, I get it. If that's all you can afford, fine. But don't build a custom log home and then just cheap out and get the main entrance. <laughs> Do you think people think about the other solutions, right? Or are we just so incubated with the with I the think the majority incubated, of the market, exactly. right? Yeah. It's just like, oh, just go here because it's off the shelf. Same with trim, you know? Like, I, I can make uh, 5,000 different molding profiles. Any, anything you want. Like any height, any style, any thickness. You want you want an eighteen thirty seven Regency, whatever. No problem. And now you can get a copy of it in, in MDF. No, you can't. You can get similar. Similar. You can get similar, but it's good enough for that client. Good enough for that client. And if it's their budget, fine. But what I hate is when people, you know, have ample means and they cheap out on their home. They have a big home, but it's basically a Home Depot home. And I, all I see is potential. I don't judge anybody if that's what you want. If you're happy with it, fine. But you have the potential for the same money to have something unique. Do you think people, I'm yours. wondering how much of the decision making, obviously we know that it's dollar, it's economic. Sure. But do we think that a lot of people are making the decision based on where their life is going to be? Well, expediency too. I just want it done. I hear that a lot. Uh, but whether or not this family is going to be together, oh, whether I, or not I that if we're still going to be right. sharing this dwelling, yeah, I really don't know. The anticipation of like, I don't think that this man or woman is going to be in my life. So I don't know. I, d I don't know if that's factoring in. Oh, it could, but that's always a personal circumstance. And don't get me wrong. There's some beautiful homes being built in Toronto that are luxury mansions and things that I, that I would love to be involved with. I can't. Some of them, there's a lot of things made, but I'm talking about the majority of what used to be an expensive home, a million dollar home used to be an expensive, you know. Five years ago, sure, a million average, dollar home no, was, was, a, was a good home, right? Um, now, I mean, that gets you nothing, a closet on Danforth. So. <laughs> I guess, well, you know the term well, mansions, right? And even to your point, maybe it's even not so much the families, but w coming back to where you started is the, the longevity of, of buildings, right? In my father's shop, there was a sign that hung, um, uh, when we build, that we let us think that we build to last for an eternity. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, that's, that's it. When we build it, let us build it so it lasts for eternity. Yeah, let us think that we build to last for an eternity. But how many builders today are doing that? No. no. What percentage? You well, you know, building code is all chipboard and crap. It's not going, there's not going to be century homes. No, on no, these no, I've said it over and over on this show. I've the greenest it. home is a heritage home. Yes. Stone foundation, yes. plaster, wood. Yes. And yet we don't build to that standard when it comes to green. We don't, no. And yet they're called green and they're not. You know, all this. I've argued over and over. It used to be Aspenite. What do they call it now? The OSB, the wafer. Well, board now pieces, they're, 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 you have Advantex, you have certain products, so they're adding more chemicals to the product. Yeah. But they're adding these chemicals into the product, so then it could be weathered longer. But we breathe it. We, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's terrible. So I'd like to know what's inside of it. Oh. It's nice to discover that we got rid of plastic straws for paper straws <laughs> that have more chemicals in them. Ah, bingo. Yes, the insanity. <laughs> but it's the virtue signaling. Oh, look at me, you know. I, God. Yeah. Uh, 
Now I don't want to use any straws except for metal straws. I, I bought grapes for us today in a plastic bag, but I can't get a plastic, plastic bag, bag to put right. them in. Right. We, know that, right. we yeah. know that argument. We yeah. don't understand Ever that. try and get into a package of hinges, you know, <laughs> the plastic wrap, the plastic wrapping. But, you get, but Rona doesn't have a plastic bag to put it in. It or they'll charge you more nuts. for that plastic yeah, bag. Yeah, it drives me bloody crazy. Yeah. And then the carbon footprint on, on grocery bags now. Oh, history will characterize this epic as insane. <sighs> There's no two ways Why can't we just look back on history and just go back to the way it was? It was being done really well at some point. There's no money in that. There's no money to crank it pro- out. It's not profitable. No, it's not profitable. Yeah, no. And, and there's it, no it, living wages. We touched on that earlier. It's not a living wage anymore for people. It's a wage for living. It's just it's it's existing. It's just barely existing for some people. Where there used to be so much pride, nobody can afford the pride because they're working two or three jobs and. I, I don't know. It's I don't know what to say except that we need to be able to keep some of our money in order to live. Well, I think we need to keep a lot of our money. I think yeah. Canada should be a zero income tax bracket. Yeah. But I'm not a politician. I don't. I can question. Well, I wish Mr. Polyevra would address that instead of just cut the carbon tax. No, 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 no. Get rid of a whole whack of taxes, like a lot of them. We don't need it. We have bureaucrats that are living high on the hog. And uh, they, they don't produce. Can we remind everybody what taxes are supposed to be used for? Well, they were to pay for the First World War. At the very beginning. But nowadays, yeah. what are they supposed to be used for? They're supposed to be used for our Well, now they go overseas, unaudited. That's the other thing. There's, mm. what, five billion we've sent to Ukraine, I believe? Is it more now? It's got to be a lot more. And it's unaudited. I call it money laundering. You could hate me for that, but I just no, think it's money laundering. I, I think it's just gone over in a blank check and... Where does it go? We don't see it. And I've seen this by reading it when you have the president's wife buying a Bugatti for $3.9 million. Uh, Zelensky's wife. Exactly. I don't understand how that happens and we don't question. No. Should we be questioning it? Of course we can. But our politicians don't allow us to question it. His Majesty's loyal opposition is supposed to question that and they don't. They're in collusion. And where's the money going? Right, and then and then you you strip it down to society, and we're now suppressed to even think, right? It's shoved down your throat. This is what you're how you're supposed to react. Well, you're look at Instagram. I, you can't Instagram. say anything that questions the narrative without being you know fact checked to death by. They're not facts. They're just suppression. Yeah. You no. Know? Who said that if you cut out a man's tongue, uh, you're not uh, you know uh, so much as denying what he's saying is that you're afraid of what he's saying. Mm. Nobody wants to hear the truth. No. Well, a lot of people want to hear it, but the powers that be don't want to hear it. So it just comes down to philosophy of, of uh, freedom. You know, we are... Fr- Freedoms aren't rights that, that uh, come from a government. We're inherently free. We're born free. We don't need a document to say that we are free. Mm. Who makes somebody more free or privileged than anybody else? So, and I, I am a... An uh, ardent capitalist and entrepreneur, I want everybody to be able to, uh, to have the same opportunity. We're not, we're equal, but we don't have the same opportunities, we're equal opportunities. Some people are born, if my father, for example, didn't happen to have a business, I don't know what I'd be doing. I was able to walk into that and to learn his craft, and I'm blessed, and I'm humbled by that. I am the lucky one, I've won the lottery of life. I didn't have to go out and make my way. I was able to learn from him and I chose to learn from him and I chose to learn that craft and I worked hard at it and I failed more times than I care to remember. But every failure is a lesson. But I am blessed, I get it. If I had grown up and didn't have that opportunity, I don't know what I'd be doing. Would I be a salesman at at, uh, a big box store? I don't know. So I'm very humbled. I. I am lucky. I've won the lottery of life. You, you know, there's, there's passion that resonates out of you when, you when you talk about that journey. My heart aches for the generation now that it doesn't seem to have any hope. And you see it all the time in of trades, course. all of you. You see it in every, and not just trades, but I say trades, any, anything in life. You know, it could be the chef, it could be the, the cook. It's careers. A- anything, any career. It's hopeless. It's hopeless for the young people that say, oh, great, you know, I got a job, $25 an hour. Wonderful. So I'm taking home $3,000 a month, my rent, 
and hydro and phone bill is 3000 So what do... There's no hope. It's awful. What do you have left over to live? You don't. You, you're not even existing. Yeah. And we've seen tent cities. We've seen the homeless everywhere. These people are not all drug addicts, as some politicians would say. They have they're no the hope. elderly, they're the young, they're the people who just couldn't survive financially. And MPs' they were pen pushed. pensions are yeah. more are disgusting compared yeah. to what they give old people. Yeah. And why are old people who have paid taxes their whole life, why are they so penalized? And property tax is another thing, you know. Just because your next door neighbor builds a $3 million home, your taxes shouldn't go up because that's the new value of the neighborhood. No, not at all. It's outrageous. They've more, gone out of hand with taxes. More corruption. Country. There's many cottages around here have been in the family for a century. They're not rich people. But because the values have gone up, they can't afford to keep the cottages. Mm. Because somebody else built or a multi-million dollar. Or pass it on to somebody else. They can't, no. They can't do any of that. So somebody with lots of money comes along and buys the land just because the family can't afford to keep it. The only time you should pay the value is when you sell the place. If your little old cottage on an island or, or your home anywhere uh, is paid for, you shouldn't have to pay higher property tax just because the neighbor's increasing in value, the neighborhood. That's my philosophy at any rate. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It, it drives people out of their home. And then, it, and then it destroys the, the heritage because people are going to come in totally. and, and tear down this old century home. Yep, absolutely. And build something new. <laughs> <laughs> Safety Corner, your weekly guide to safer construction. Introducing Safety Corner, the latest must-watch show from the creators of The Construction Life. Co-hosted by safety expert Philip Farrar and powered by his S1 safety division, this 30-minute weekly series cuts through the noise to bring you real footage and raw insights from actual job sites. No fluff, just hard-hitting analysis, and Philip and myself break down what went right, what went wrong, and what could have gone catastrophically wrong. Each week, we tackle the biggest safety issues facing the industry today, sharing the knowledge every tradesperson needs to make it home safe. Whether you're on the job or managing the site, Safety Corner is here to help you build smarter, safer, and better. Tune in to revolutionize the way you approach safety on the job. Catch Safety Corner weekly because safety isn't just important, it's essential. No. Do you find it difficult, John, to find <laughs> these clients that appreciate? Absolutely, yeah. I just do what I can. I'm not, I'm not super busy like I'd like to be with these clients because there's a decline in taste overall, as I say. People want expediency. And the only thing I can do is make things that don't exist. And I tell people, if you want something that already exists, you don't need me. If you want it made, then I can help you. So how often do you say no versus how you say yes? Oh, 90, 10, 10, 10 split? I, if that. I would say that, yeah. yeah. 10 times out of 12, I have to say I can't help you. I have to walk away. But they found you for a reason. Yeah, because they need it made. They need it made. There's a prominent designer in Toronto that uh, hired me to make their front door because they're on a, uh, a heritage designated property and like you, you, can't, you can't buy a door that fits in there. They have to have the same wooden door made to that style because it's designated and that's what it has to be. That limits your market. It's not a, a mass production market for me, but I enjoy it, that's it. So it's all restoration work. It's all yeah, something re reproduction or, or restoring, a lot of restoring. I'm privileged to work all over this province on much restoration. To try, again, to try and preserve what we have for the next generation to enjoy. So, so hang on a second. Oh, you've worked in a, uh, in a bowl of different places. Can you identify one or two or three sort of projects that make you smile every time you think about them? It just sort of resonate like this is going to be around for the next hundred plus years. There's uh, something I probably made twenty dollars an hour on, and I worked nine months, but it was a joy. And I've got photographs of it somewhere. A client wanted a reproduction of an English Elizabethan dining table and it was four carved lions rampant okay and i carved that and i said you need a quarter million dollars <laughs> and it's going to take me this time he got his calculator out and he played around with it he said i got eighty-six thousand dollars. 
do what you can. What did you I do? gave him the same damn thing that I was going to do for full rate, but I did it to, for my happiness. And it sits in his home, and I've got pictures of it. I've got the client's name, and you know, I don't know if he wants that out there, but he's a prominent industrialist, and he, uh, he loves that table. But I gave him the same thing because I thought, this is a legacy piece. Yeah. And I signed the bottom and I made it. I got carpal tunnel syndrome because I had a two pound mallet and a chisel in white oak for months after months. I had to take a break and have surgery um, because it was just, uh, I almost crushed my kids some days after a day of pounding a mallet because you'd walk in and hug them. <laughs> you, know, you don't know your own strength, right? You're, you grab a teacup and it crushes. <laughs> But that's the kind of thing I really enjoyed, yeah. And you just touched on something, and the word legacy came up. Mm. And this really struck a chord with me because earlier today we were talking about end of life. Yeah. Death. And I know right. I'm on my way out. I'm not, I don't have, you know, 50 years ahead of me. It's just a fact of life. You, you deal with it. So how, you know, and then you talk about legacy. And is, is this something that is, in your opinion, thought about, not thought about enough? Is it, like, what's your thoughts on... on Doing the work for a specific reason, you talked about the legacy you want to leave behind, does it exist? Do people think about, how do I want to be remembered when I'm not here? I don't think many people think like that. They live for the moment for whatever reason. A lot of people tend to be shallow. Um, uh, a lot of people want friends and no enemies, so those are the people I tend to avoid. Uh. I have a very small circle, but no, people that are deep thinkers um, think about legacy. I, yeah. I think there's a moment in, and I'm going to talk about tradespeople because early in my days, I worked on older homes and I was fascinated by the fact that you can demolish a section of it and rediscover the craftsmanship that was put at that time, exactly. whether it was a hundred years ago, you discovered how it was made. Mm. Yeah. And, and I go back to the, there's a moment in a tradesperson's life where you have to decide whether you want to keep your soul or lose your soul. Oh. Bingo. And I think it's designed because people will look at it like, I'll make a thousand dollars if I just shut up, quash my soul and just build it versus, and I know I've been in that situation where you had that door, you're connected to it mm. and you wanted to build it. And I've done it. I've built several things where I didn't make any mo money off of it. I didn't survive it. I just, I basically put money into it, mm -hmm. but I did not kill my soul as a result of it. Exactly. I was proud of it and I know it's still there to this day. But this is, this, is what, this is what's been lost. This is what's been lost. The heart and soul. There's a moment. There's a moment in a trace. Every tradesperson's life, they decide. Mm -hmm. They decide whether this is just about making well, money. Well, let's say artisan. Could be any, artisan. It could be in any yes, medium. It yes. could be a house painter. 100%. It could be a portrait painter. Yes. It could be a jewelry maker. It could be any, any, any not just trades, but the, I guess the craft we're talking yes. about. Any, any, anybody that creates something. Yes. Could be a writer too, right? Sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people. You can give in and just do what they ask and get paid for it. And it applies to anything that works with your hands. Yeah. And, and for some people, they're fine with it. I've never been fine with it, but it, all it does is create friction with clients. They, they hire you, they find you, they choose you, they want you because of what you've done in the past and how you've spoken about the details that are associated with it. But yet when the money, the budget is getting out of hand, they beg you to compromise. Oh, every time, every time. And some people lose heart, and that's what bothers me. I put a post on Instagram a number of years ago about that, losing heart and whether or not you put your soul into it. And Georges Bizet, one of the greatest operatic composers ever, and you would know his music if you hear it. It's in movies, it's in everything. Sure. He, he died young, basically, of a broken heart because his music was criticized. He was pilloried. He wrote the Pearl Fishers and Carmen, which are the two most played pieces in the operatic repertoire on the planet. In his lifetime, the critics pilloried him. They, he died very young, thought he was a failure. He was just ahead of his time. So you can't let it get to you. You have to rise above it and just be authentic. Had he had the, I guess the physical courage and mental courage to persevere, he would have buried his critics. Because now we don't know who his critics are. They're dead, but we know Georges Bizet. Do you think today with social media it's the equivalent of back then? 
when you had that small circle so. that once you were attacked look at the critics on social media. i know it, it's, it's very it, similar it can destroy something you've never met these people never you don't know what them. they look no. like but yet they have free range to just decide like dissect you rip you apart and dismiss everything that you've done beforehand because you disagree with something that they've said done mm -hmm. or built or well, they don't like what you desire. But you never met this person. Well, can we? Yeah. Like, I'd love to go back to a day where, tell it to my face. Mm -hmm. And I think ninety nine point nine percent of the people will never say it a word to your face. Well, even in Bizet's day, you know, nineteenth century France, that was still newsprint. I mean, newspapers were devastating, right? Critics, critic hated you. You were done. That was it. But where the, we don't remember the names of the critics, right? No, and it's all misunderstood do, information because if somebody dug into said, you know, talk to me about your post, your post might mean something or might mean nothing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But all of a sudden it's criticized and ripped apart and, yeah. Yeah. right? But it comes down to having the personal courage and to, uh, I mean, he was a genius. <laughs> he, he created music that we still listen to today. We love it. Uh, it's in movies like constantly, his pieces, and, and yet he didn't have the fortitude to, to carry on. So that's sad. I mean, so there is a passion, but it gets back to that horseshoe making thing. You know, if you want to make horseshoes, and you're, you're you're an idiot, you won't survive unless you're going to make the best horseshoes for the king's plate, for all the wealthy people, because that is the sport of kings. That is the very wealthy. There's a few places around here that that have equestrian stables, uh, and they have tons of money, and they will buy the best. So that's what you have to focus on. But as I say, if you want to sit in downtown Toronto in your condominium and make horseshoes, you're going to be a failure. Do you get frustrated about all those <laughs> towers that are being built? I got such. Oh, of course I got I do. so frustrated when City Place started announcing and when they were looking at 21, 22 towers, whatever it was, coming off of Spadina. Oh, it's just, it's and I, do, I don't... I don't I don't appreciate a single one of those towers. I don't. I, I don't. I look renovated at, condos in there. It's outrageous. I don't understand. There's like, no parking. <laughs> there's no parking. But it's not even. It's just the aesthetic, the architectural aesthetic, and the there layout. There is no architecture. That's aesthetic. what I mean. There's nothing there. So what I do in those interiors is to accept the fact that it's a box, and but you recreate a Parisian flat or a Georgian interior. You can put paneling. You can add beautiful flooring. You can create artwork. Mm. So there's lots you can do with it, but most people can't see past that. You know, they buy the Hunter Douglas blinds or whatever. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying they all look the same after a while. You know, have drapery made. You know, on this humble boat, there's drapery made. There's Why are we so afraid to be individual? <laughs> Very much so. People are terrified of Why? authenticity. Why? Ninety-nine percent of critics, my clients say, "Well, well, my neighbors like it. Oh, they might think I'm Who putting on airs. Oh, your they family, might, they your... might think." Uh, it's that whole thing that they don't want. Nobody wants you to be to appear to be better than them. You know, you have to all wear the the current fashion, right? We all have to wear the same things. We do. I don't have same anybody's logos, label no, on know, here. Yeah. You know, you know. I jokingly walk up to people and say, "Hi, Tommy," because they got Tommy all over their <laughs> shirt. You know, like okay, why? Like, uh, hello, like, uh, uh, my name's not Tommy. Well, then why are you wearing Tommy? What is, right. that, what is that quote from Heath Ledger where he was talking about why is everybody so critical? They're only interested in asking what you do for a living, where you live, and uh, what you own. They yeah. never ask you how you are. Exactly. Ooh. Exactly. Absolutely right. Because how you are is a reflection of who you really are. But everybody's curious about what your job is, how much money you're making, and where you live. Oh, they want to know if you're important enough it's to a know. World of, to continue it's a the world conversation. Of labels. Yes. How are we labeling you? How am I classifying you? Where, where do I fit in this socioeconomic conversation? But the same thing comes in construction. Absolutely. When you choose a wolf range, when you choose a specific brand product, and it, it has to be has to be the latest and the greatest. Yes. Or even before that, there's e even even the folks doing the work, it comes before that. I don't want to talk to the electrician, mm. I want to talk to the foreman, I want to talk to the foreman, I want to talk to the, to the project manager, I, I want to talk to the boss. I want to buy this, I want to do this, right? So. I have um, a dear old client that's, uh, he's a billionaire and a noted philanthropist in this country. And I say that only because I, I want you to know that he, is legacy money. He's like fifth generation, old money. He knows things. He understands and appreciates the philosophy of preserving what we have for the, you know, for the next generation to enjoy. He referred me to a neighbor. I was building his kitchen and renovating his interior and he wanted it made. His neighbor, who I'd never met, kept trying to get me over there to build the same thing. 
hounding him to death. And he fi- I never met the man. And finally, my client said, can you just go over there and talk to him because he's bugging me? I went over there. <laughs> There was 10 trucks in the way. I had to grab whatever piece of crack truck was there just to borrow one because it was the 10th one out, the last one in the driveway. I get in this rickety old thing. I drive over. I'm covered in mud and crap. And I, I had told him I'm coming over. So that's fine. I look like hell because I actually had to examine the foundation of this home. So I was a mess. I said, I'll pop over and have a look. I showed up to this guy's house. Talk about shallow. He answers the door, looks at me up and down and says, get out. I've got somebody important coming wow, here. Wow, 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 wow. And I said, well, I am. I don't care who you are, he said. He cut me right off. He said, get your piece of crap thing out of there. I've got an important designer coming here. Wow. I said, I am John LeBlanc. Lewis just sent me over. We're done. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Comes down to that whole thing. How you treat the waiter is what, what? Uh, identifies you as an individual. I've seen clients treat tradespeople poorly right in front of me. It's disgusting. It's a uh, Oscar Wilde said, "We're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars." Right. Uh, so, but that sort of thing—it's dehumanizing. It's disgusting. And ironically, when the billionaire came to my studio originally. He was dressed worse than I am, covered in mud. Why? Because he had been in his rose garden, covered in mud. He was planting and playing with his prized roses. And he shows up to my studio. I welcomed him. I didn't, you know, treat him badly. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know how much money he had. I didn't care. He was another human being that came to talk to me. That's all it takes. That's it. He had me published. (coughs) He had me published in Canadian Home Workshop. He was so happy with my work. And Don Ross wrote, locally here wrote the article. And I'm just saying, that's, that's humanity. So this billionaire who could buy and sell all of us was more of a human being than his damn neighbor that threw me off his property because I had an old piece of crap truck I was driving and I, w- I looked like hell. What kind of truck was it? <laughs> it was just some staff truck. I don't know. Some of the young kids had a truck, whatever. I don't know. I just grabbed the 10th one that was there <laughs> because I couldn't get to my vehicle. You know, when you get a job site, there's so many trucks. Is it, can I just borrow that for 10 minutes? So you're not going to move 10 vehicles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you just take, nah. that, that's camaraderie. My point is that's humanity. We work together to, to make it happen. Humanity is everything. Feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders? You're not alone. Working in the trades can be tough, long hours, physical demands, and the constant pressure can take a toll on your mental and emotional well-being. It's time to invest in you. Steps to Happiness Coaching offers personalized support to help you manage stress and improve work-life balance, build resilience and overcome challenges, enhance your relationships on and off the job site, and find purpose and satisfaction in your work. Life coach Teresa Greco understands the unique pressures of your world. You'll learn practical tools and strategies to unlock your inner joy. Let her help you build a stronger, happier you. So don't let stress hold you back. Schedule a free consultation today. You deserve to be happy because life is too short to be anything but. Check out Steps to Happiness Coaching at TeresaGreco.ca or email Teresa at steps to true happiness at gmail.com or connect with her on IG at Teresa Greco underscore steps to happiness or Facebook Steps to Happiness with Teresa Greco. This message is proudly supported by the construction life. So I have a very small circle as a result. Eh? <laughs> very small circle. Um, I, except Authenticity is everything. You know, you say a small circle, and it's probably a, a tremendously important circle because that's what makes you who you no, are. Not, 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 not important, important, but important to you because that's make, makes that you're a product of, to of, me. of, of that environment. Important right? people so much. It's just they're important to you. I've seen kids. And they make you I, who I've you are. Older, I've they're seen older. everybody reveal a great idea. And to me, that's important. It, I've never looked at your sex, your race. Never, I, I, never, never, never. I've never, never, never questioned never. it. If someone no. is is the new person, first day, last day, I'm a good idea is a good idea. Contributing is, is that's right. It's craft. It's artisan, right? We that's tell, that's we, where we're at. Yeah, we tell people all the time. I don't give a shit about anything else except, you know, can you do the job? Do you have a good idea? I'm the and best person got, for the job. Yeah, period. what do you got to contribute? Can you? Can you contribute? Are you the right person? The answer no. is yes. I don't give a shit about the other parameters. Is Canada going to be respelled to C A N D A 
E I or D E I. Yeah, Canada Canada Day is what I was trying to get at. C A N D E I. Yeah, like are we gonna? Is that the next one that's gonna be planted? It comes down to merit, right? We want the we want the best people for the job. Period. It doesn't matter what it is. I agree, but not not anymore though. Were you like me? Were you cringing when Bombardier got the deal for the streetcars when they were late on everything? Uh, again, that's just more co- government corruption. That's it's, all it is, right? It's, it's they were on the verge of bankrupt. There was a German company that would they would be out a of business. Job. They would be out of business without the taxpayer up, support. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of families living high on the hog because of government taxpayer handouts. It's corrupt. It's insanity, and it should not be happening. Who's your fra- favorite trace person? Like trade. What trade are you envious of? I, I'm not really. I. They're I all won't equal. say trade. I will say craft. Craft. Okay. So when I'm yeah, I I'll mean, tell you something. I, was, I think that a good tradesperson who knows their that skill. And it was very humbling because somebody was was heaping praise on me once, but I had made some beautiful circular stairs and a gothic front door for a church, and and they said, "Man, you can do anything you build." I said, "No, I cannot. I cannot build a violin." I could build a violin and it would look beautiful and it was gorgeous carving, but it wouldn't sound very good. It wouldn't good. sound great. And that's building. I cannot time. do that. And that's humbling because I cannot make a piece of wood sing. Mm. Right? And that's, that's when you realize just how stupid you are and that you don't really know everything. Right? I can make a, a facsimile of a violin. It could look beautiful, but it would probably sound like hell because I don't know the nuance. Oh, no, he gives Sorry. me a signal sometimes. Sorry about that, yeah. <laughs> This is getting in the way of my cigar, at any rate. No, um, but it's the nuances in life. So, no, we, we can get high on the hog of thinking we can do anything under the sun. We can't. I think I've seen so every single tradesperson impress me to the level of artisan. I can honestly say that I've seen work coming from plumbers, HVAC, trim Absolutely. carpenters, tile setters. They've done little techniques, little crafts, little details that I'm like, you realize that you're an artist, right? Yeah, you understand absolutely. that you're an absolutely. artist. You're not a tradesperson. You're an artist. Absolutely. When I was a boy, my father's plumber. Um, he had everything was copper in those days, and everything was perfect. His soldering joints were perfect. And he stood there one day and he said, "I'm, I'm sad that it all has to be covered up." Mm. And I almost laughed, and then I realized, my God, it is, it is art. Every soldering joint is perfect. Yeah. Everything's. Perfect, and it has to be covered up, and nobody sees it. That's pride of workmanship, and that's what you just said. That's Everybody, if they're good, is. yeah, it's. Do you think the trades, po- trades folks generally s- realize that they're artists? Do you realize that? Do you think no, I, I don't. I think the majority I mean, of them think it's it's just a job. It's, it's just a job, and it just comes naturally. Well, I don't think anything of it. Well, you know, nice. I'm gonna say electrician, right? It's, well, nice pipe work. It, it, it's a craft to, to go into an electrical room with nice pipe work and to see it all yeah. tied in together. So folks don't even think about that. It's a balancing craft, though. Was it Calvin Coolidge or some, I think, that said every job worth doing is worth doing well? well yes. Right. And it's, um, it, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, people that, that denigrate the, the baker and say, excuse me, are you, are you enjoying that muffin? Are you enjoying that cookie? Sure. Oh, they're just a baker. No, 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 no. Oh, you're, no, no. You're, you're a multimillionaire and you're going to that shop and talking down to the baker to get your favorite cookie. Are you stupid? Like, are you stupid? Like, why, why are you talking down to them when they have created what you covet? Uh, right? Everybody, everybody has something to give in some way. But I find if they that put the, their mind to it. The industry has a hard time properly pricing their craft. They don't, in fear of not getting the work. Of course, absolutely. At all the time. Absolutely. I just, I don't. Because the competition is out there. There's always somebody to. But it's not apples and apples. It's not. That's the problem. It is absolutely not. It has never become an apples and apples bidding process. It never is, no. I still hand paint our kitchen cabinets because they're going into a home that's hand painted, for example. You know, to see a beautiful spray-painted lacquer kitchen and then it's up against, you know, hand-painted casing, it's like, what, what's the point? Mm-hmm. Why Blend it. Make it all the same. That, that's my philosophy. So it costs more time, 
but because I use a hundred dollar varnish brush to to finish the paint. But I'm just saying that kind of attitude. It's not apples to apples because some guy just gets the spray gun out, plops it in place, and then it's on a rolled wall or something, and it's 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 incongruous, right? You get a perfect finish here, but then it's around a, a painted MDF baseboard and casings. And but where does our <laughs> client vacation? Yeah. So where do they vacation and what do they stop at? And when they tour, when they go visit locations, when they go eat at restaurants, mm -hmm. when they go visit structures that have been around for centuries. Oh, they love and, that. And they appreciate and they touch and they see all the wear and tear. Exactly. They see the grain. They see all the sanding, all the work, the craftsmanship that was put in there. And that's and what I want in my interior. They come home to a pristine, clean, mm -hmm. lacquered, finished. White. Generally white. <laughs> White, a lot of white on Instagram. Ah, gently it's lace. soulless. <coughs> gently lace. Yes. <laughs> no offense to my dear clients that like gently lace. There's a time and a place for white. Uh, I've built white interiors because it's, it's an art gallery. But what I'm right? fascinated about your work is I, I see all the darkness and I yet I still see so much character in the darkness. I like jewel tones. I like color and character. I know? love that. I like, well, this interior, there's bronze, there's yes. my dear fiance, Cheryl, she does, uh, she chose these pillows and we have the great taste and uh, the same great taste. And in, in our opinion, it's great taste because I don't mean great as in it's better than anybody else's. I mean, it's classic. If you stick to natural materials, natural metals, you know, bronzes, gold, silvers, if you stick with natural colors, garnet, ruby, emerald, natural tones, jewel tones, cobalts, that's natural, right? You'll All those colors work. Wrong. You can never go wrong. No. You'll never go wrong. No. People that go and look at, as you say, beautiful, they go to Venice and they, oh, look at the colors, look at the, look at the murals, look at the, the... And then they go home to a sanatorium. <laughs> I, I just... It's soulless. It's so and true. not a book in the place. Not a book in the place. So how, how did Lily Baldwin, the great, dec sorry, the great hey. decorator in the 40s and 50s and 60s to Hollywood, he, he said, you know, the best decoration in the, in the world is a room full of books. And I mm -hmm. cannot mm -hmm. agree more. Mm -hmm. I always like to include a bookcase somewhere, something like that. There's um, the other quote where it's, if your TV is larger than your book collection, mm -hmm. then you have an issue. What did I repost the other day about Lamborghini? He says, we don't advertise. Oh, yeah, yeah we don't advertise because that's not where our customers are. Tel on television because our clients do not watch television. No. <laughs> so, but our go. clients now are all over Instagram. Our clients are all over social media. So now that's the dictating factor. Well, up to a point. Up, up to a point. The, no real great successful people that's going to buy a Lamborghini or generally on. Unless you're a basketball yeah, player yeah, and I you just it. suddenly, you know, get a... So another funny story on that, my the Lewis over here that uh, sent me over, that I built the kitchen for, that sent me over to his neighbor that yep. threw me away. Yep. He was hosting a cocktail party for his newly renovated home. And a local NHL hockey player shows up to his cocked by boat. And he's got a beautiful brand new speedboat, a poker boat. And he looks at this old wooden mahogany gleaming vessel there. And he says, who's that? And Lewis said, well, that's mine, son. He says, oh, you should have one of these. That's an old boat. Look at this. And he said, well, well, son, let me tell you. This was made for the King of Sweden in 1938. And it held the world's record at the time as a speedboat. And they, they don't make that anymore. You, you can't buy it. Anybody can finance what you have. But you can't buy this. There's only one. And it's got provenance. That's the difference. That's the How do you difference. bring this back? How do you bring that ideology and that philosophy back into humanity? Well, get rid of the public education system right okay. off the bat. You know. That's I'd it. get rid of the word education in that phrase. Well, there's professional educators and then there's teachers. And the two are vastly different. I could not be a parent today. I'm not a parent, so I don't know. You guys have the challenge. No doubt. In the system, the way it's designed. I struggle with that. I have four kids and I... I struggled with it. It's mind mind numbing. What's so age range there? Uh, twenty nine to twenty. Yeah. But go on. Four kids. You know, when you talk about there's uh, the framework, there was there's teachers and then there's educators. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean a professional educator just goes through the curriculum, marks their time, and does whatever they does whatever the government tells them. And then there's a teacher. 
Put it this way, when I was a boy, I struggled with mathematics. I got 27% in grade 8 in mathematics. My father sat me down and he said, OK, son, you can't figure out this Pythagorean theorem. He said, I need to put a ladder up there. There's the wall. And how long a ladder do I need? I had a practical application. I figured mm. it out in a heartbeat. That's a teacher. He didn't just say, like my teacher, professional educator did, say, well, it's right there in black and white. What don't you understand? You know, but my father said, no, no, no. Imagine that part of the triangle is the wall. That's true. And that's the floor. And that's the ladder. How long a ladder do I need? Bingo. And then the light bulb. And the light bulb. That is a teacher who will work at explaining it to you until you actually understand it. And some people need a practical application. I need a practical application. Many people I do. Know. I have built 40-ton floating boathouses. I do complex mathematics. I do all kinds of things. But I, I couldn't do it on black and white in an abstract form in school until I had an application. Then you, you know, got it. Yeah, you know, like I wanted to build floating things and uh, work in boat building and... I needed to learn because I wanted to also. But nobody is ever going to learn what they don't want to learn. Of course not. Right? You, you have In to fact, it turns them off. And then, and, then, and then it's a ripple effect of like, totally. you know what? It, it, it becomes a loss. And then, it, and then it's so hard to get that human being back on track to say, well, here's, here's where it comes into play. When my son graduated, he was 18, got out of high school, I said, did they teach you how to do income tax? Of course not. No. What? No. We just taught you how to be a laborer. Just do what you're told. And then they're given a tax form and they're like, oh my God, what the hell is all this? They don't, they haven't taught you anything. Really, it's disgusting. They learn more from a home life and a family business than anything. How important is post-education these days? No, I don't think it's very important unless you need to be a doctor or something. A specific career. But, you know, to have a, I don't, again, I don't mean to denigrate every, anybody. But there are some useless courses out there, or, or there's a glut of uh, a glut of people that really don't have a job to go to. So, they, so it shouldn't be offered. You know, if we only need, let's say, a thousand English majors in this country this year, why are we turning out ten thousand? Because there's no job for you. So that's hmm. a part of hmm. it, but it's that whole system. Well, the education about. system. They got to churn a, out. Just churn them out. Business in There's itself. a great question, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, you just nailed it. If we only need a thousand people, why are we, uh, you know, exactly. taking ten thousand in? Because it's a business, and what happens to the other nine thousand people? There's a lot of bricks screwed, and mortar out there to right? pay for. Got to pay for that bricks and mortar, right? All the institutions, you just churn them out. It's useless. Right? So that, that's my attitude. But it's the fault lies again. It all comes back to government as far as I'm concerned. Every level of government, every form of government, it's, it's just mismanaged. And Canada's just been quite the fiasco. Totally. And totally. status. I think I'm going to throw mm. status in there too because in, mm. in my opinion, there's a status of going to a post-secondary college or education to come up with, with, with letters or degrees mm. or whatever it is, right? I know lots of people with a degree in psychology that don't have a job. Yeah. That, that never intended to be a psychologist. <clears throat> but it was an easy course, and I got a degree. I won't say easy, forgive me. No, it was easy for them at the time. What about the argument about you meet certain people that influence the rest of your life going to attend post? So you're surrounded. Do you? I don't know. I'm questioning. I, I, I just no, say that that argument comes up. Yeah. Do you, I, like I, I mean, you meet certain people that will influence the rest well, of your life. Well, there's days. also those who can't. Yes. Teach. Because <laughs> they don't know. Yeah. I had a client that wrote many, many books on how to write a business, uh, how to run a business, and he taught uh, at, a, at a higher education uh, how to run a business, and he tried to open two restaurants and failed twice. But he's written books on it, and he lectures on how to run a business, <laughs> but he's failed twice. Uh, I love like, you. It's outrageous. No, yeah, I love he had all the theory in the world. <laughs> All the theory in the world. You needed a ladder and a wall. Yeah, but, you know, all of a sudden, let's say the chicken that you just got is all rotten and you can't serve it. So, oh, well, there goes that money out the window. That's not in your textbook. That should be an addendum right there. Like, you just lost money before you even opened the doors because everything you bought, the, the fridge broke. And uh, you, I, you've lost everything. Oh, I, right? I, I love how casual you say it because it's like, I don't give a shit how many letters you have after name or how many... How many businesses do you think mm. you can run? Mm. If you can't run a business, why am I learning from you? Well, and it comes back to construction. Like, we yeah, all know it's going to take me three months to build that <laughs> house. Everything's going to be perfect. There's going to be no problems. Right? 
It never happened. And then it never happened. Yeah. It never it's happened. rained for six and weeks straight. And told you that, yeah. <laughs> I had one client with a foundation that just washed in repeatedly. They kept digging and digging, and the rain would come, and it would. Uh, they lost six weeks of just rain. Uh, they lost all their money right there. It just they had to keep digging out slurry and sludge and slush because of rainfall. That's not in the contract. That's not in the client doesn't care. I'm paying you that much money to build the house. Well, guess what? The client client's pissed off. The contractor loses money, and the job gets hurried, hurriedly done because the client isn't smart enough or kind enough to say, "Damn it! I realize you had to dig that hole out six times." And Are you ready to build a life that's not just fulfilling on the job site, but off the job site too? Welcome to Building Joy, the podcast series from TCL that's all about crafting a brighter, more satisfying existence in every corner of your life. I'm Manny Nevis, the host of the Construction Life TCL podcast, and together with happiness life coach Teresa Greco of the Steps to Happiness, we're laying the blueprint for true happiness. Every episode, we dive into real challenges and opportunities construction workers face in their pursuit for joy. From the long hours and the physical grind to the alliance and pride in the job well done. We're here to show you how to bring more joy into your work, your personal life, and everything in between. Got a story, a question, or just need some advice? We're all ears. Email us at Manny at the construction life.com or steps to true happiness at gmail.com or drop us a message on social media at TCL underscore the construction life or at Teresa Greco underscore steps to happiness at building joy. We know that happiness isn't just a dream. It's something you can build one brick at a time. So tune in, connect with us and start laying the foundation for a happier, more fulfilled life. After all, the greatest structure you'll ever build is the life you lead. Join us on Building Joy, where we're constructing a better tomorrow, one episode at a time. Because life's too short to settle for anything less than joy. God, here. Oh. But there's the human compassion again, right? It, it doesn't exist. No, exactly. People just want a deal. Yeah. Because they want to go tell their friends and everybody, I got a good deal on this. Mm -hmm. I got a good deal. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's Is that the second runner-up to it? First, you decide on the brand, the the status of what you've created or what you purchased and the second is what you paid for that status maybe so i i, I think that um human beings innately want to talk to their friends and family about how they got a better deal i mean i just think of uh, italian heritage you think around sitting around the table you know i got this guy who got me a good deal but yeah and what's mm -hmm. the next guy no no i got a better guy who got me a good deal but it's not I, a radio I, I, no it's or tv like they think they could, if they save $10 on a TV, fine, it's a commodity. As you yes. say, it's apples to apples. But it's, yeah. not, it's not in the world of exactly. created things. Um, the, the, you know, builders, framers, for example, are they putting two nails in each one or three? Like right. that's the difference right there. And there okay. are framers that do that. <coughs> Absolutely. They'll save a box over the course of the wall. Exactly. And they're just thinking it's great. So who knows? Maybe they've got alimony payments. God knows <laughs> what it is. Maybe they're alcoholics. I don't know. But it, No, uh, those are the drywallers. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't get me started. Yeah, there's there's like four screws across the four-foot sheet. It's like, hold the phone here. <laughs> yeah. And I don't always have control over those things. If I'm coming in on the finishing stages and I see these things and they're red flags and I tell the client, you know, you've got to do this. And, no, I, well, I got a deal. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gotten Okay, you got a $50,000 Persian rug we're going to drop here, handmade. But, you know, you saved me you know, 1000 bucks on drywall. Are it's you not worth it. Are you stupid? It's not worth it. Are you stupid? And then a year later, oh, there's cracks up there. You think there's cracks up there. Yeah, there's cracks up there. Like, oh, my God, whatever. The insanity. Pound <clears throat> foolish penny wise. Have you had clients ask you to, um, to go the old school route, the lime plastering route? I just did one on the beaches. I'm doing it right now. I love yeah. that. I absolutely just, love it. Yeah, because they wanted a little slight texture on the, on the wall uh, that you can only achieve by hand troweling with a pool trowel, you know, with the rounded edges that don't leave a uh, square edge. I just had to do that. I love that for Those a trades are far and few across I, Canada. I, I was just blessed at my point in life to have grown up with plasterers and things. And I, so I don't know how to plaster really well. I, I couldn't do an entire home and I wouldn't pr presume to, but let me do a Venetian plaster wall. Yeah, I can do that once. Even some mural painting or something. I can do that. Yeah. I, I couldn't profess to be really great at it forever, but if you want a certain look and it'll be a unique creation once, yeah, I can do that. It's fun. So I, I do like that, but I'm not going to presume 
presume to call myself no, plaster. No, 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 but, but you'll find somebody. But, but I, I've seen house it. Needs to I grew done. up with it. I know yes. how they do it. I used to carry stuff for them. I'd mix it for them. I would do all kinds of things. In those days, as I say, growing up in business, and even the way I run my business, you work with people, you all help. Um, that's just what you do. And so, yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. But Who are you seeing, John, like today's younger designers, architects, tradespeople that are impressing you? Um, or is the list very short? I, it, the list is very short. And oh. again, I don't want to mention names for Okay. Out of respect, too, because we all have our art. Of course. There's a few really good designers that I respect, but I find uh, the facsimiles of classic architecture. Again, the everything precast, everything done, so it looks like a beautiful stone, or it looks like... Um, it, it, it's got the, the look of something that's classic, but it's all CNC. It's too perfect. Mm. Super There's no perfect. character to it. Too perfect. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it before. And slabs of MDF everywhere painted. Like, come on. Like, intricately carved. Oh, the CNC carving machines drive me nuts, too, because, you know, beautiful carving. But it still lacks the depth that you can only achieve with a gouge by hand, the undercutting and all that stuff that you can... Who's going to reproduce, you know, a, a stone cherub on a church or something? Like, it's a not, CNC machine can't I do don't it. think that this... Interesting that you brought this up, especially church. Uh, there's a there's a church being built close to where we live, and it's gone up rather fast. And every time we drive by, our children are saying, "How's it going up so fast?" Mm. It's timber structure. The other day, I drove by, and from a distance, driving up, it looks like the uh, the stonework's all done. Right? Like, wow! I don't remember seeing the scaffolds go up, and it was pretty mm. quick. You get you get closer. It's precast. Yeah, it's oh, all yeah. precast, yeah. right? On a church, to your point, the, <coughs> the craftsmanship is lost. Well, I spent a How lifetime studying sacred architecture. What we call sacred architecture is just the idea of, of the... Um, it, it's nothing to do with religion, per se, but Gothic architecture is called sacred architecture because pi is infinite. It's God's number. Okay. Pi has no end. And that's all based on the circle. Gothic architecture is based on circles. And, uh, you know, what they created, the Chartres Cathedral in 1167, or like all these ancient uh, cathedrals all over Europe, we couldn't do that today. The stone ceilings vaulted? Are you kidding me? Is it for vaulted two reasons why you couldn't stones? do it today? Because of the artisans? Lack of artisans. We could do it, but again, they would use all precast things. That's, just, that's fine. Make it work. But nobody would put the money into it. What Because it would church? cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Because it took centuries to build. There was that church on Parkdale. Was it, I'm trying to think of King or Queen. It was Queen and, and Jameson area. There was a church there that burned. Yes, yes. What was the church? Well, we name? lost many churches. We lost politics. recently, yeah, which is kind of interesting. A lot of arson, yeah. Obliterate, but, uh, obliterate when, our history. When they rebuilt it, they rebuilt it with fabrication. And I don't even recognize the structure. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. Because I remember that it church. It should have been reproduced, too. We need stone carvers. We need to preserve the glories of a vanished age for those years which we will not see, right? Mm. And we cannot do it. I remember having an academic discussion with some jackass at Altawall Mandarin that uh, said, oh, he hopes that the Houses of Parliament burn someday because it's too colonial oh and we gosh. would build something new and Canadian. And like, Are you kidding me? What is new and Canadian? I, he couldn't define that because I asked him pointed questions. Well, just something that reflects our diversity and everything. No, we, and I said, I'm so sorry, but we are a British dominion in part of a worldwide yes. commonwealth. Yes. We are a kingdom. We are not a bland republic. I mean, love or hate the monarchy, I don't care. It's who we are as a history. We do have a culture. We do have an architecture. We have Westminster style, like the Houses of Parliament in England. I mean, that's what it's modeled after. That's why yeah. we have a Gothic yeah. parliament. That's a philosophy that not everybody would agree with, but I like tradition. Uh, Gustav Mahler said that the tradition is not the worship of ashes, it is the preservation of fire. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about to me, because nobody knows how to light a fire these days. Right? Is there an app for that? <laughs> <laughs> There's no app for that. 
There's no vapor for that. Put people out on a bloody island and say, light a fire, there's no matches. You know, that's, that's the thing. You know, they'll be on YouTube. You know, okay. Do you think, John, <laughs> you'd be able to see a difference in, in Canada before you leave? You think Canada will turn? I think it's... For the better. It's going to take a, it's going to take a generation, I think. It's going to take a lot of poor people right now, angry and fed up with the way things are, to make a change. It's mm. going to have to get much worse, I think. Because yeah, the I Parliament lives in a bubble. They're so detached from reality. So detached from reality. Put them on minimum wage, as they say, and see how fast things change. Mm -hmm. That's an old saying. Accountability. That's an old saying, but it's true. Make them suffer like everybody else suffers and watch how fast things change. They don't appear to be suffering at all compared no. to the rest of the citizens no. of this country. We're not the only ones in, in that situation as well. well. Working poor are poorer than they've ever been. I'm certainly poorer than I've ever been, you know, in terms of, of work. You know, you have to work so much harder to... And the clock is ticking, right? Like, how long can I keep uh, carrying on? It's, it's, uh, I keep fit every day. I'm fine. I work hard, and that's good, but bloody hell. I mean, yeah, when I'm 80, I probably can't do the same thing. Who knows? We'll see. But you, people are going to have to get really angry and make a political change. Big time. You think the younger generation has it in them? It's amazing what hungry people will do. Mm, true. All of a sudden, people get angry enough and they become revolutionaries and generally governments drive them to that. And it's a terrible thing to say, but I mean, the French monarchy, the most powerful army in, in Europe on the continent, and I don't include England as Europe because England is its own country, mm -hmm. but on the continent, I mean, the French Revolution, they guillotined their king and Marie Antoinette. Did they get anything better with the result? No. No. No, they got another corrupt republic. But people got angry, and at the end of the day, it just comes down to attrition. You don't have enough police. You don't have enough army, because... I remember a, a wartime story, and my, you must remember my family steeped in the war because we... His upbringing, you know, my father was grateful to survive the war, but... Churchill said something to a housewife one day. He was touring the coast. And my, my father relayed this, and my uncle was uh, a king's messenger during the war, which is a fancy term for a spy. Mm. But Churchill was touring the coast, and all the men were off fighting, and a housewife said to him, like, what do we do if the Germans land here? What can we do? He said, you've got a kitchen knife, don't you? You can always take one with you. Attrition. If everybody just fights back one at a time, and I'm not calling for revolution, I'm saying governments will drive a people throughout history. It's this historical fact. Governments will drive a people to rebellion. Of course they will. The cities are everywhere in decline. Trade, industry, agriculture, all bend under the weight of taxation right now. Everything. Everything is just bending under the weight. It's unsustainable. And yet there is an elite that lives above it and profits more. And the greatest transfer of wealth, again, happened in 2020. We lost private businesses, we lost restaurants. And where did it go? Walmart stayed open. Yep. Costco stayed open. Essential services. But couldn't go to a restaurant. No, nope, you couldn't You could support. go to McDonald's. Yeah. So things like that. People are being driven to the point of no return. And they will be called... All kinds of names that, you know, oh, you're, re you're rebellious or you're, you know, you're a threat to the government. So, but no, we're just no, trying to live. If the government is a threat to us. You're starving people to death. And I, and I beg Parliament to, to really think about this and, and get rid of this weight that's crushing everybody so that there's hope. We were the greatest imperial power in the history of the world. We were the country that went to Normandy. We were the country that the Germans feared in the, the Nazis in the Second World War. I mean, and now we're, we're not even allowed to raise our voice because it's offensive to somebody. How do you think we educate people around this? Like, Forgive I, the sermon. But no, you know, not a sermon it, at all. It's, it's beautiful because you keep bringing this back up and the role that history plays 
study history, study history, and history lie all the lessons of the future. Mm. Period. That's it. It's all there. It just repeats. That's that's all I can say. I'm not I'm not an educated man that way, but I have read voraciously in my father's great library since I was a boy, and I read and read and read, and it's all there, black and white. You know, it's just. Ah. Sometimes we live in a culture that was like they, they suppress that. Yeah, they suppress that, and they think, "Oh, I'm going to rewrite history. I'm going to shift the way history was." Are, are, are we? Yeah. Listen, folks. Like, how deep do you want to go? There's well, different layers. <laughs> Churchill tried again, um, in 1946, in his famous Iron Curtain speech. He said, "You know, the, what was the point of the Second World War? What is the point of the United Nations organization? He said, to, to, to give security to these countless homes." They must be shielded from the two gaunt marauders, war and tyranny. We all know, the, those of us that have seen active service, we all know the frightful disturbance that occurs when the ordinary family is plunged into darkness and despair. The awful ruin of Europe with all its vanished glories and of large parts of Asia stared us in the eye after the Second World War. And he said, when the designs of wicked men or the aggressive urge of mighty states dissolve over large areas, the frame of civilized society, humble folk are confronted with difficulties with which they cannot cope. For them all is distorted, all is broken, all is even ground to pulp. When we sit here this quiet afternoon, we have to shudder to visualize what millions are going through in fear of famine and war and tyranny, because there is war, and war is on our doorstep. But that's a great lesson that he spoke of. And we have to learn from that. Otherwise, what is the point? What was the point of the Second World War? What's the point of the United Nations? What is the point of having all these liberties? And the Nuremberg Code which was overthrown during COVID, where you're not allowed to experiment on a human body and force people to accept medical mm -hmm. procedures. That's exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. And that, all of it, it, it's just history repeating, repeating. I, I don't know what else to say about it, but you study history, and uh, that's one thing they don't choose to, to, to teach. No, it's, it's not, and it's not, it's not even, it's, it's not even recommended. To study history and then if you do study history it's well people think it's the recitation of dates it's not i have to study history if i want a period interior for example i look at old paintings mm -hmm. ah that's that's the color they used look at that goblet look at that table look at the drapery i want to recreate that so it's relevant to the visual arts but it's also relevant to the philosophy of life but that touches on our earlier discussion, too, of we're being pushed and pushed and pushed to starvation. When people are hungry, oh boy, mm. then you've got a tinderbox. And I fear that more than anything. I fear the tinderbox of what this country could become. And, and our civilization, too, not just this country, but the whole of Western Europe. Our culture being suppressed. I had some jackass tell me, well, we don't have a, a culture here. Are you, are you kidding me? What's Magna Carta? What's our architecture? What's democracy? What's, that's our culture. Was he a Canadian? Yeah. No, not at all. He was uh, a, new, a newly arrived Canadian, shall we say. Got it. <laughs> Just said, said, we don't, don't, have, to, we don't, don't have a culture. I said, our culture is, stands in Italy as the Colosseum. It's the Acropolis. It's, you know, British architecture or the federal architecture in the States, the White House, that's Roman and Greek. Mm -hmm. Come on. I mean, Parliament, that's Gothic. That's our culture. Don't tell me we don't have a culture. Oh, you're just a melting pot. No, we're not. No. We have a very distinct... We were powerful. on track. It was on track. The greatest imperial power in history. We were. To this day, our, our Commonwealth is a third of the globe. India is the largest democracy on the planet and an ally, and our staunch ally against China. China is terrified of India. There's a billion and one people there, 1.1 billion in India, that is the only army on the planet that can 
withstand the tyranny of China, man for man. And it is the world's largest democracy with English as an official language. We have a culture. We have an association. We are powerful. If we choose to exert it, and we have exerted it for good, people will focus on the bad little things that, oh, you know, well, you had slaves or something. Oh, my God. Well, no, we didn't. We abolished it in the British Empire in 1833. The Americans fought a civil war over it in the 1860s. We led the way. I don't know. It just comes down to the philosophy of our way of life is a great culture, and I think it's worth uh, preserving and promoting because it is a free culture. I mean, the Second World War and the First World War proves that. I mean, we fought with our allies. I mean, India put in two millions of men in the British Imperial Armies in the last war. Two millions. Like, come on. We, are, we were a United Nations before there was a United Nations. We still have the potential for that. So we do have a great culture. It's a shared tradition of democracy. And uh, I, I love this country. I don't like the government, but I love this country. And I think we all like the freedom to express. Because without freedom, we cannot do what we do as artisans. You cannot be here as great sound mixers, and I applaud you and your cameramen. My God, you have talents that I could never have. But it's all free creation of art and we need a civilization that supports that not suppresses it because pretty soon it'll just be well imagine if this was for example cbc or something doing it there would be probably 50 people here to do what you're doing and and it would be a half million dollar setup and and there'd be hotels and there'd be <laughs> the removal of the flag and no cigars oh yes there'd be no cigars there would be <laughs> Yes, exactly. It'd be interruption after interruption of the things that could or not. It'd be would. edited 10 ways to Sunday. Yeah. Uh, Either way. Sorry, I'm rambling on no, again, no, but that's just what we're here what I for. This is, the, this is the stuff that folks don't, you know, a lot of people don't talk about. No. I Do you get into the commercial world, John? Yeah, I've designed and You've designed restaurants? Built or about 44, 45 takeouts and restaurants and things like that. You yeah. prefer? No, as long as it's unique, that's all. Mm-hmm. I find that there's a lot more creative freedom yeah. when it comes to a commercial application. Yeah, a lot of a lot of budget restrictions too, though. So it makes you think more about how to expand that budget. You know, how to capitalize on it, how to make every penny count. And we end up, as every designer and every builder does, you you end up putting more into it than you get out because you care about it, right? You want it to look good, especially in a public place. You yes. want it to look good. Sure. You want it to look really good because people are going to see that. More so than in a private home. Does that make sense? That no, it sense. makes 100% sense, but, but it's the private home only has social media for its exposure. Yeah, versus guess, an actual commercial place, whether it's a restaurant, mm -hmm. whether it's a hotel. or Well, you know, and restaurants sort of have gone to hell these days, the bland homogeneity of everything. That's where I, I was headed with. I just sometimes I get invited to openings <laughs> and I look it's at them. It's just outrageous. And I just like, I don't understand why everybody's very complimentary of what <coughs> I'm seeing here because there isn't a single thing to compliment. Yeah. There's a chap in all the wall that uh, consulted with me ages ago. He bought an old bank, and he said, "What would I do in here for a restaurant?" I said, "Don't touch anything. You've got you leave. stone pilasters. Yes, just put in tables and chairs, and you don't need me for anything. Just keep it." Did he? He did. Good. Yeah. Stunning. So that's so that's, that's, that's what I'm talking enjoy about. A meal and, and appreciate. And you look at you know, stone pilasters and crown molding, but it's all stone, and everything's beautiful, and. Uh, and That's you approach it from a legacy standpoint. You didn't come in and, and, and look at how can I make a sale here and tell this guy everything. No, not at all. You just no. said, look, let's restore, let's, let's appreciate this and keep the integrity of it. And this is what I'm going to do. Well, I've sat on, I think, three different municipal <laughs> heritage committees. I've been involved with the organizing Ontario Heritage Conference for the municipalities. I was fundraiser for it. In that capacity, I was invited into the Royal York when they were about to demolish the beautiful mm. double helix staircase that was in there and destroy that interior. Nothing could be done about it, but we tried to preserve it. They blasted it all out, got it on video, they jackhammered it on. Do you remember the double helix staircase yeah. of the Royal York? It's yeah. gone now. They've put in oversized furniture. They've put in furniture that doesn't even remotely blend with the majesty of that building. And it was out of, uh, you know, a New York design firm that it wasn't attached to Toronto. Why are you doing that? Why didn't you get... I have an issue with that. A, 
Toronto I, firm I, I, to preserve, and they did the same thing in the Chateau Laurier. I have an issue in, in Ottawa. They just it's destroyed things. Have a local empathy. Were you a fan of the Crystal? Crystal, the ROM. Oh no, no, God, no, not at all. Sorry, that thing. No, no, not at all. No, no. It was a beautiful no. building. No. And I, I got, I do Lewis Samuel very well. He endows the Samuel Wing of the Royal Ontario Museum. I mm -hmm. built things for him. I, I, I love his philosophy, but that had nothing to do with him, unfortunately. Like it was just a wing of the overall ROM. But I think it's disgusting. It doesn't, it, it doesn't blend. Looks like hell, at any rate. But that's just me. And I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be uh, somebody to say, oh, it's new, therefore I don't like it. That's not it. it That's not what it is. It has to be sympathetic. Yes. I like to make an addition look like it was never added on. Yes. And it that should be sense? built that way. Exactly. I need another cigar.